All right, good evening, everyone. This is chapter seven, thinking and intelligence from the psychology, uh, second edition uh, textbook um, published by OpenStax. Here we go. My mouse isn't working right. All right, there we go. Um, so first let's talk about what is cognition because right, that's thinking. Um, thinking and cognition are kind of synonym synonymous, um, but it's most simply, it encompasses the processes that we associate with perception, with knowledge, with uh, having judgment, problem solving, um, language, uh, and, and memory. Encompasses all of those things. And so when it comes to cognition, um, you know, we, we're constantly bombarded by information and, sen and sensation, right? Taking in all of this information. And when our brains receive that, it's filtered through, um, through our emotions, it's uh, filtered through our memories, and um, eventually becomes um, our thoughts, right? Uh, kind of one of the therapies that I like to use is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Thoughts, feelings, and, uh, and behaviors, right? So our thoughts affect the way we feel, our feet, the way we feel affect our um, uh, behavior. So, um, and I lost my point where I was going with that, but, but um, so you can kind of see the progression, right? Um, on where our thoughts come from. All right, so uh, there are a lot of terms in this chapter uh, that we're gonna talk about. And, um, and today we're gonna start with uh, concepts and prototypes. And, um, and this is basically the way our brain organizes information. And so um, with concepts, these, these are categories, right? Of like linguistic information, images, ideas, um, memories. Um, and we use, we use concepts in order to see relationship, uh, relationships among different elements of experience, right? Um, they can be very, complex and abstract, for instance, the idea of justice, right, um, is, is a concept, or they can be very concrete concepts, for example, types of birds, or types of animals, right, types of dogs. And a prototype is the best example or the best representation of a concept. For example, here is Mahatma Gandhi, right? And, um, or Gandhi, sorry. Um, and he would be like the prototype of the category for civil disobedience. Or maybe um, Martin Luther King might be the prototype for, um, you know, um, uh, peaceful civil disobedience um, in the furtherance of like civil rights, for example. So prototypes are those best examples, or, or here's another example of a, of a prototype. You know, when we think of sodas and everything else, <coughs> and I'm not advertising for Coca-Cola, but people use the concept of, you know, the prototype of Coca-Cola. It's like, oh, give me a Coke. And it might literally mean a Coca-Cola, or it might mean, you know, some other carbonated beverage, right? So prototypes, when you think of a prototype, it's usually like the best example of it, of, of a concept. And then there are different types of concepts, right? So we have natural concepts, and then there are artificial concepts. And this can get a little confusing, so hopefully my examples will be, will be helpful with this. Um, natural concepts are those concepts that we develop, that we learn, right? that are created naturally through either direct experience or indirect experience. So um, the book uses the example of snow and I actually kind of like this example. Um, and here's why. Everyone in this classroom has a concept of snow, right? Um, I'm not sure, but maybe there is someone in this classroom that has actually never experienced snow, maybe not. Um, but a person who's experienced snow 
um, who's walked in it, felt the cold, saw it dropping, right? That is direct experience. Indirect experience would be like seeing pictures of it and, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, seeing pictures of it, being told about it, um, seeing it in movies. Um, so you know what snow is, even though you have no direct experience with it. Um, I think one of the homework questions that I um, have is, you know, where it talks about dinosaurs, right? Our, our, our concept of dinosaurs has been uh, created through indirect experience, right? Nobody's actually experienced a, an actual live dinosaur, but we see it in Jurassic Park, um, we, you know, uh, we read about them in books, we see, we go to the Natural History Museum in Balboa Park, um, and you can see the um, fossils and the, and the skeletons. And then the next concept are artificial concepts. And those are defined by a specific set of characteristics. Um, and the easiest way to think of, of them, if you look at picture B here, right, is ge geometric shapes, right? Uh, squares, triangles, uh, you see that, that globe, that circle there. Uh, those are all um, artificial concepts. Um, <laughs> any questions on natural or artificial con concepts? This is another set of things that, that can be easily confused if we read exam questions too quickly. So I just want to encourage you to uh, slow down on the when you're reading questions um, and doing your reading actually too. The next sex, the next thing I want to talk Hi, about. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, does a natural concept have to be something that exists specifically in nature or would something like a building be considered like a natural concept? Oh, that's a good question. Nobody's asked me that. Usually when I think of of um, natural concepts, I think of things that, that we just encounter naturally in our environment, like you know, dogs, and, um, uh, birds, uh, the snow, weather, the ocean. Um, huh. Maybe like a pyramid or something. Yeah. Like that, that. You know, well, here's the thing, and this is why I want to make sure that I don't answer incorrectly, because the artificial concept surrounding a building, right, you could describe the building as being rectangular or pyramid shape, right? Um, and normally when I think of artificial concepts, I'm, I'm thinking of the, those kinds of shapes. Um, uh, throwing me a curveball, that was really good. Um, let me... Uh, you know what, let me write that down and I am going to come back to that one because I wanna make sure I do not mislead you. You guys are good. For the time being, let's just stick with, um, uh, with the artificial concepts being designed by specific set of characteristics like the shapes, for example. Um, uh, also think mathematical, mathematics fits in there, things like that. Uh, natural concepts, I'm thinking more, that's what we naturally uh, experience or can experience uh, in the environment, either directly or indirectly. So even going back to the dinosaur example, um, there's no way to have a direct live experience with them, but there can be direct um, experience with their remains, right? If you go to the museum, you can see the T-Rex uh, thing. So I, I uh, wrote that down and I am going to come back to you on that question. That's a great, great question. I wanna make sure I get you right on that. Nobody has ever asked that before. So I've never had to really think about it. All right, um, let's see here. Yes, and so Antonio says the word natural is nature and not man-made or created. So, um, 
So yes, that would be, that's sort of where I am leaning as, as well. But uh, I just wanna make sure before I put a final answer on that. All right, so let's talk about schemas. We all have them <laughs> and there are different types of schemas, right? So a schema is basically a mental construct of, of, um, of related uh, concepts that we've put together in a collection of things, right? And when a schema is activated, we automatically make assumptions about the uh, person, place, thing, situation, um, and it's gonna be based on our schemas. So um, a lot of times, for example, a role schema, makes a, uh, assumptions about how certain individuals in certain roles will behave, right? So, um, so like the question here, what assumptions come to mind when you think about a librarian, right? Anybody wanna throw out a couple of ideas? What comes to mind when you think of a librarian? Strict. What's that? Strict? Being strict. Yeah, yeah. being strict. Always telling you to shush. <laughs> what else? Any anything else? They All enjoy right. reading. They enjoy reading. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, exactly. So you guys are kind of getting that, right? So in the in in these schemas, and by the way, our schemas can be wrong. So I want to point that out. Um, but what's what's important to know is that we automatically make these assumptions based on our schemas. And then there's also what's known as event schemas. And this is like a cognitive script that runs through our head, right? Which is a set of routine or automatic behaviors um, that can uh, uh, dictate behavior. And it is gonna vary um, among cultures and, and in different countries based on what those individual experiences of that society is, right? So when you're riding in an elevator, what, is, what kind of things do you think about with, when it comes to an elevator? What kind of event schema or routine or behaviors do you engage in in an elevator? That was a real question. <laughs> Well, here's what I do. I get in the elevator and I push the button uh, and I face forward. Why do I do that? Because that's where the door is going to open. That's where the door is going to open. Yeah. Why else do I do that? <laughs> Antonio's <Observing> like. Surroundings. <laughs> Antonio, Antonio, that's good. He says if it's a two-door elevator, which where do I face? I'll tell you that in a minute. <laughs> uh, and then and then Matt says everyone else is facing forward. Yeah, so we're just gonna we're going to um, um, we're just gonna go with the one-door elevator for the for the time being. But the event schema, you know, our behavior is is that you get on the elevator and everybody faces the door. A lot of times you'll pay attention and they're looking up, they look up at the, you know, uh, at, at the floors moving. Um, sometimes there's no con eye contact. Sometimes there's no talking, right? Um, because there's just a certain, there's just a certain behavior that is kind of expected in, in certain situations, right? So I got, I got a short, funny little vi video. This is anybody here. Um, well, you don't have to answer, but Candid Camera. It's an old TV show that would catch people doing, would set people up um, to be recorded um, in, in strange situations to see how, how they would react, right? And a famous one that I'm about to show you is the, um, is the elevator experiment. And when I'm at school, after I do this lecture, usually when I'm live, Right after this, I will usually go in the elevator and I will face away from the door just to see what people will do. And it's actually kind of funny, but here, let's, uh, uh, hold on one second. I want to make sure I 
prepared this correctly. So what do we do in an elevator? Making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera. <laughs> Now, here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First, he makes a full turn to the rear, and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use... Now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Notice, they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. The gentleman. Oops, sorry. All right. So uh, getting back to the event schema. So that's kind of just a, a, a really funny video that I like to show. Um, and it's interesting too, because we're talking about event schemas here, right? What's the perceived behavior? How are we supposed to act in certain situations? The other thing that's interesting about this, and we'll hit on this again in, um, in the social psychology uh, learning chapter, is also about conformity. Um, if you notice, especially that last uh, young man, right, with the hat, and um, you know, he he was changing his behavior to conform to what was going on around him, right? So we have a couple of things going on here. Um, but that's one of the things I want you to remember about event schemas: is this is just behaviors and um, uh, and processes that we go through. Um, based on our own cognitive script of how we're supposed to be in certain situations, right? Um, the thing about event schemas, though, is that they are difficult to change because they are automatic. Um, you don't need, and when I say automatic, there's an idea within, that I use actually in, in cognitive behavioral uh, therapy that's um, involved with automatic thinking and automatic behavior. And that can be very, very difficult to change because if we're doing things automatically, we're not even really thinking about what we're doing. We're not really present in the moment. Let me give you an example of, of some automatic things that I do, right? Um, I get out of my car and, you know, and I have one of those, you know, key things that, you know, I can lock the door with the push of a button, right? And I just do it so automatically that literally, when I get inside my office, I'm like, did I lock my door? Because I wasn't even thinking about it. I wasn't even present. It's just part of my event schema. I'm getting out of my car, I'm locking my door. And it's just happening automatically. Get in an elevator, I face forward and I look up at the, at the display, right? Um, don't talk, right? Um, that's not always true, but you know what I mean. For the most part, that's, that's a lot of that. Um, an example of a, an event schema that, that I have presented here is, you know, like when we receive a text, our event schema is to automatically pick up the phone and reply, right? That's just what we do. I get a text, I got a reply. The problem is, is that the automatic reaction can arise in situations when it's not safe to reply, right? So for instance, texting and driving um, or, if you go back to the last PowerPoint schedule where we were talking about positive punishment, <laughs> scolding a student for texting during class, right? They probably reacted to their event schema and just automatically did it and weren't trying to be disrespectful or not paying attention. It's just automatic, right? Um, <coughs> all right. Any questions? We're going to move into language here for a second, but in a second. 
any questions on um, schema or um, uh, role schema, um, event schema? All right. So like I said earlier at the beginning, um, there's a lot of key terms in this chapter. So, and you, you will see all of these in one way or another in your homework or the exam, right? So what's important, what I want you guys to realize too is um, you may see these as uh, maybe not a direct question, but they may be possible answers on a multiple choice. And it's really important that you understand each of these so that you can make the correct um, response to the, to the question. So let's talk about what is language in general. So it's a communication system um, that uses words and rules, right, to organize those words and transmit information. So, um, you know, uh, words is, is, um, is our lexicon, right? So that's a term that I want you to know. When you hear the word lexicon, that's the words of a given language, right? Um, and then grammar is the set of rules used to convey meaning through the use of lexicon, right? So in other words, how we put the order of words together, right? Adjectives before the nouns, for example, right? Um, uh, or in Spanish, it's sometimes backwards, right? Opposite of that. Um, phoneme is the basic sound units that you, that you hear in language. They're, they're the ahs, the es, the, the you know, uh, the k sounds, right? They're, they're the basic sound units. Um, and, and I'm gonna show you a, a video here in a minute that's really interesting uh, called the Linguistic Genius of Babies, um, where they actually have done research on, on the sounds that babies pick up on. And, um, which is how they begin to learn language. It's really, really interesting. So phonemes are the basic sounds that are in a language. Uh, the morphemes are the smallest units of language that convey some type of meaning, right? And so language is constructed through semantics and syntax. And semantics is the meaning we derive from morphemes and words. And syntax is the way that the words are organized into sentences. So getting back to the earlier definition of, of language, right? Um, it involves using words and systematic rules. So in other words, I can't just say, oh, I don't know, uh, picture, card, license plate, globe. I'm looking around like flag, um, lamp, I can say all those words, but it's not in a sentence. It's not in information in, in any way that, that any of you can use, right? So uh, that's where the rules come in. Um, all right, so, so Patricia Cole, she, um, she does research on this and and I just love baby videos anyway, it's just adorable. Um, but this is about 10 minutes uh, and it is really, really interesting research that has been conducted. So this is called the Linguistic Genius of Babies. It's also available in um, Canvas. So some of you may have already seen this um, or maybe you haven't had time to, but I definitely wanted to talk about it here. <laughs> I want you to take a look at this baby. What you're drawn to are her eyes and the skin you love to touch. But today I'm gonna to talk to you about something you can't see. What's going on up in that little brain of hers? The modern tools of neuroscience are demonstrating to us that what's going on up there is nothing short of rocket science. And what we're learning is going to shed some light on what the romantic writers and poets described 
as the celestial openness of the child's mind. What we see here is a mother in India, and she's speaking Koro, which is a newly discovered language. And she's talking to her baby. What this mother and the 800 people who speak Koro in the world understand that it, to preserve this language, they need to speak it to the babies. And therein lies a critical puzzle. Why is it that you can't preserve a language by speaking to you and I, to the adults? Well, it's got to do with your brain. What we see here is that language has a critical period for learning. The way to read this slide is to look at your age on the horizontal axis. <laughs> You've done that. And you'll see on the vertical your skill at acquiring a second language. The babies and children are geniuses until they turn seven, and then there's a systematic decline. After puberty, we fall off the map. No scientists dispute this curve, but laboratories all over the world are trying to figure out why it works this way. Work in my lab is focused on the first critical period in development, and that is the period in which babies try to master which sounds are used in their language. We think by studying how the sounds are learned, we'll have a model for the rest of language, and perhaps for critical periods that may exist in childhood for social, emotional, and cognitive development. So we've been studying the babies using a technique that we're using all over the world in the sounds of all languages. The baby sits on a parent's lap, and we train them to turn their heads when a sound changes, like from ah to e. If they do so at the appropriate time, the black box lights up and a panda bear pounds a drum. A six-monther adores the task. What have we learned? Well, babies all over the world are what, are like, what I like to describe as citizens of the world. They can discriminate all the sounds of all languages, no matter what country we're testing and what language we're using. And that's remarkable, because you and I can't do that. We're culture-bound listeners. We can discriminate the sounds of our own language, but not those of foreign languages. So the question arises, when do those citizens of the world turn into the language-bound listeners that we are? And the answer, before their first birthdays. What you see here is performance on that head turn task for babies tested in Tokyo and in the United States, here in Seattle, as they listen to ra and la, sounds important to English but not to Japanese. So at six to eight months, the babies are totally equivalent. Two months later, something incredible occurs. The babies in the United States are getting a lot better. The babies in Japan are getting a lot worse. But both of those groups of babies are preparing for exactly the language that they are going to learn. So the question is, what's happening? during this critical two-month period. This is the critical period for sound development, but what's going on up there? So there are two things going on. The first is that the babies are listening intently to us, and they're taking statistics as they listen to us talk. They're taking statistics. So listen to two mothers speaking motheries, the universal language we use when we talk to kids, first in English and then in Japanese. Ah, <gasps> I love your big blue eyes. So pretty. And nice. Wow, oh,きな tailoi,omeme. So stekirena kuroi kami. During the production of speech, when babies listen, what they're doing is taking statistics on the language that they hear. And those distributions grow. And what we've learned is that babies are sensitive to the statistics, and the statistics of Japanese and English are very, very different. English has a lot of R's and L's, the distribution shows. And the distribution of Japanese is totally different, where we see a group of intermediate sounds, which is uh, known as the Japanese R. So uh, babies absorb the statistics of the language, and it changes their brains. It changes them from the citizens of the world to the uh, culture-bound listeners that we are. But we as adults are no longer absorbing those statistics. We're governed by the representations in memory that were formed early in development. So what we're seeing here is changing our models of what the critical period is about. We're arguing from a mathematical standpoint that the learning of language material may slow down when our distribution stabilized. It's raising lots of questions about bilingual people. Bilinguals must keep two sets of statistics in mind at once and flip between them, one after the other, depending on who they're speaking to. So we asked ourselves, can the babies take statistics on a brand new language? And we tested this by 
exposing American babies who'd never heard a second language to Mandarin for the first time during the critical period. We knew that when monolinguals were tested in Taipei and Seattle on the Mandarin sounds, they showed the same pattern. Six to eight months, they're totally equivalent. Two months later, something incredible happens, but the Taiwanese babies are getting better, not the American babies. What we did was expose American babies during this period to Mandarin. It was like having Mandarin relatives come and visit for a month and move into your house and talk to the babies for 12 sessions. Here's what it looked like in the laboratory. So what have we done to their little brains? <laughs> we, we had to run a control group to make sure that just coming into the laboratory didn't improve your Mandarin skills. So a group of babies came in and listened to English, and we can see from the graph that exposure to English didn't improve their Mandarin. But look what happened to the babies exposed to Mandarin for 12 sessions. They were as good as the babies in Taiwan who'd been listening for 10 and a half months. What it demonstrated is that babies take statistics on a new language. Whatever you put in front of them, they'll take statistics on. But we wondered what role the human being played in this uh, learning exercise. So we ran another group of babies in which the kids were get the same dosage, the same 12 sessions, but over a television set. And another group of babies who had just audio exposure and looked at a teddy bear on the screen. What did we do to their brains? What you see here is the audio result, no learning whatsoever, and the video result no learning whatsoever. It takes a human being for babies to take their statistics. The social brain is controlling when the babies are taking their statistics. We want to get inside the brain and see this thing happening as babies are in front of televisions as opposed to in front of human beings. Thankfully, we have a new machine, <laughs> magnetoencephalography, that allows us to do this. It looks like a hair dryer from Mars, but it's completely safe, completely non-invasive, and silent. We're looking at millimeter accuracy with regard to spatial and millisecond accuracy. Uh, using 306 squids, these are superconducting quantum interference devices, to pick up the magnetic fields that change as we do our thinking. We're the first in the world to record babies in an MEG machine while they are learning. So this is little Emma. She's a six-monther, and she's listening to various languages in the earphones that are in her ears. You can see she can move around. We're tracking her head with little pellets in a cap. So she's free to move, completely unconstrained. It's a technical tour de force. What are we seeing? We're seeing the baby brain as the, ba as the baby hears a word in her language. The auditory areas light up, and then subsequently areas surrounding it that we think are related to coherence, getting the brain coordinated with its different areas, and causality, one brain area causing another to activate. We are embarking on a grand and golden age of knowledge about child's brain development. We're going to be able to see a child's brain as they experience an emotion, as they learn to speak and read, as they solve a math problem, as they have an idea. And we're going to be able to invent brain-based interventions for children who have difficulty learning. Just as the poets and writers described, we're going to be able to see, I think, that wondrous openness utter and complete openness of the mind of a child. In investigating the child's brain, we're going to uncover deep truths about what it means to be human. And in the process, we may be able to help keep our own minds open to learning for our entire lives. Thank you. All right. Ah, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I love this video. There's a couple of reasons for it. One, she, she talks about a lot of different things. I think one of the most interesting thing is, um, is the critical period for learning language. And, and if you recall from the chart, uh, it definitely shows that, um, that 
you know, as we age, it gets more and more difficult to learn another language. Um, the other thing that I kind of want to point out, and I'm not sure if I can squeeze it back here to this point. Yes. So there's another idea in, in psychology that's known as the language acquisition device. And it's, that's what it's called, but it's not really a device. And it's not really a particular uh, area of the brain. Um, the idea behind the language acquisition device is that as when we are learning our language, that different areas of the brain are actually all being activated, which is actually shown right here by the research. Um, so the, so the, if you ever hear the term, and I've talked about it before, um, language ac acquisition device, we're talking about all these different areas that are all lit up right now, right? Um, and that's, that's kind of the theory behind language acquisition. Um, and I kind of wanted to highlight that as well. The other thing that I wanted to highlight from this video um, was when she talked about the, the uh, social brain, the social aspects of our learning and that human beings need to be present for that to be occurring, especially with, in this speci specific case with language development. Um, that, uh, um, what was I gonna... that, that, that we need that social interaction, that human there, that you're not, that the babies weren't learning it from video or audio alone, that they needed that social, social interaction. Um, question came through about uh, um, stuttering, right? Like, so if, if the person uh, stutters, would that impact, um, uh, the baby's taking of statistics. And honestly, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I'm not sure if there's any research out there that has been done on that. Um, but yeah, it's a natural question to think of. Like what would the, um, uh, what would the um, impact of those statistics be? And, and I, I just don't know. So, um, so with language development, um, Norm um, Chomsky proposed that the mechanisms underlying uh, language acquisition are biologically determined. Um, and that language acquisition follows similar patterns in children's from different cultures and different backgrounds, which this, the last video I just showed you, kind of shows you the same thing, um, that, that, the, that the patterns are the same, even if the sounds that are being statistically uh, collected by the children are different, right? And then the other thing is that there is a critical period um, where proficiency at acquiring language um, is maximal in early life. So the best time to learn a language is younger rather than, than older. Um, and then being deprived of language during critical periods impedes the ability to fully uh, acquire and use language. Now at the beginning of the semester in chapter one, um, I showed you guys the um, story of Jeannie. You remember the, uh, the child that had been locked away for the first, oh, I forget now, 12 years of her life. And when she was you know, rescued from that situation, um, she was able to learn words. She was very curious. Um, she, she learned a lot of different words for a lot of different things, but was never able, oh, she was 13. Uh, she was never able to um, uh, learn the grammatical aspects of language. So she had trouble, you know, um, communicating in that way. She could point, she could uh, point to something and say bird or whatever, but she was not able to really use language to communicate. Uh, and it really kind of goes back to that, uh, that social brain 
aspect that uh, that Patricia Cole talked about um, the the need for the human interaction, um, uh, the need for the child to be spoken to uh, in order for that to happen. And you guys will remember that Jeannie was deprived all of that um, in her early years and is unfortunately um, a ward of the state. So to this day, you will see or you have the potential to see uh, a question on Jeannie um, on your exam. So I really wanted to hit on that. Uh, so this would be twice this semester that, that we've talked about her. Any questions on language development or Patricia Cole's video or, uh, or the case of Jeannie and language deprivation or acquisition? All right. Um, oh, question coming through the chat. What about when you exposed a child um, with two languages? So that good question. And Patricia Cole did address that in the um, in the uh, in the experiment. And you'll recall when they had the human interaction when the children were exposed to both English and Mandarin that. Um, the English uh, speaking or the, the American children, right? It only took them two months to catch up to recognizing those sounds in Mandarin that the other children, the Mandarin children had been exposed to for 10 months. So with the human interaction being exposed to the two languages, they were able to take statistics on both of those. And remember, and in the video, she says, that um, people who are bilingual, and I know that there are bilingual individuals in this classroom, right? Um, that, uh, that she said that they must flip those scripts in, in, their, in their brain, right? Um, in order to move from one language and into the other. Um, and so uh, those of you who are bilingual, um, that is pretty awesome. <laughs> and I got a yes and a C. <laughs> Awesome. That was awesome. All right. Very good. Any other questions? Yeah, it's just incredible. I'll just make one last comment on that video. It's just incredible the, the level of detail we're able to uh, study the brain with nowadays. It's, it's so cool. Um, all right. Uh, if there are no other questions on language, language acquisition, critical period. Um, we'll move into uh, the next section, which is talking about problem so uh, solving strategies. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, the book describes, and I'm sure all of you all are aware of all of these. Uh, we do it all the time, right? So for instance, trial and error. Um, we run into a problem, we're trying to solve it. One, one thing we might do is we might try, I'm gonna try this solution. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, that didn't work. I learned from that. I'm gonna try this, right? Um, and that trial and error approach um, continues until the problem is solved, right? Another problem solving strategy is what's known as an algorithm. And that is basically, you're, we're creating a step-by-step -step problem solving formula. Um, so I'll give you an example like um, at work. I'll use an example for me at work, right? So uh, last year we transitioned from one EHR, which is an electronic health record to a new EHR. Um, and there's been some issues that have come up with that, right? Um, especially with training new employees and different systems. Uh, and so me, I'm a very algorithmic, kind of individual. I like to do things step by step. Um, and so to solve the problem on how um, to overcome some of the errors that were happening in entering new clients into the system, um, I went in there and I actually just started doing it myself and creating a step by step thing. Okay, so we go from here to here to here, right? Um, 
I created the, uh, uh, the documents for it. And then I train um, the new, new people coming in and using a step-by-step -step, um, uh, solution. The county comes in, audits us, and we're not having any problems, right? So, uh, so that would be an example of, um, of uh, an algorithm, right? Or, or an algorithmic approach to something. And then heuristic is um, a general so problem solving um, framework that we might use, right? That includes like uh, shortcuts, um, basic rules of thumb, um, working backwards, like solving a problem by focusing on, on the end result and, and, and going backwards and going, okay, um, this is what we ended up with. Where did we begin, right? So how can we, how can we solve the problem in that way? And then of course, breaking larger tasks into series of smaller steps. And it sounded like somebody might have unmuted. Is there a question? Okay. Um, so then when do people use um, heuristics, right? Um, so I always like to, I, I like the analogy of how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> one bite at a time, it's kind of like a joke, um, but that's one way that people use it, right? So if the information is just too much, too overwhelming, right? Um, people might use shortcuts or rule of thumb, or they might break the task into smaller series of steps. Um, the other reason why a person might use uh, shortcuts or other ways of getting around is when the time to make the decision is limited. So I've got to make this decision and I've only got two hours to do it. I don't have a whole lot of time for trial and error and these other things. Um, so I might take a shortcut. Um, and of course, uh, when the decision being made is maybe not as important, if I don't think it's that important or a person doesn't think it's that important, they might do some shortcuts, knock it out of the way, just get it off their, off their plate. And then of course, when there's access to very little information when using, when making the decision or when um, an appropriate heuristic comes to mind uh, in the same moment, right? So you might think of something right away. In your, in your problem solving framework. All right, let's see. So this is, uh, oh, I see a question, hold on. Right, exactly. So another example might be um, uh, wisdom says, skimming through the instructions just by looking at the pictures, LOL. That's true, right? Uh, uh, you know, I would need to put this thing together. And it's like, I know I should take the time to read the instructions, but I want this done in an hour. I don't want it done in two hours. Yeah, perfect example. People can practice problem solving abilities, right? By doing like games like this. And sometimes when I'm doing it in live class, um, I will actually do a couple of these on the board and have a little bit of fun. But remember we lost a day of lecture. So I'm trying to make sure that we have enough time to get through everything. So kind of skip through that. You can see these in the book as well. Um, these can be fun uh, when we're live, like connect the dots, connect all four dots using straight lines without lifting your pencil. You know, I would draw these on the, on the whiteboard and then have student volunteers go up and like four or five of them at, at the same time and see what people come up with. Um, and, and it's an interesting, inter interesting demonstration of um, problem solving skills. But here's the answers. <laughs> so there's your answers right there. So. so when you play games and do puzzles and things, you're actually practicing your problem solving skills. Now, there are pitfalls to um, problem solving. And Albert Einstein has a very famous saying, a lot of people um, know it. If, <laughs> if you're in recovery, you definitely know it. And that is insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? Um, and so 
we get stuck in these pitfalls and um, sometimes it can be difficult for people to get out of them. And one, one um, pitfall is, you know, uh, functional um, fixedness, right? In other words, that's the inability to perceive an object for being used for anything else other than what it was designed for. So, you know, the, the candle, the match and the box of tacks example, um, and you need to mount it to the wall, what would you do, right? Um, very few people think to use the box as a holder for the candle. So the solution to it is, is in the picture here on the uh, lower right-hand side. Uh, but when they conducted the experiment, you know, people didn't think to do option B. Not all of them did anyway. Uh, so we get stuck in this way of thinking about things um, and can have difficulty going around that. <clears throat> and the persistence in approaching the problem the same way that has worked in the past um, can also make us uh, get stuck, right? So if that problem stops working, I mean, if that solution stops working, then, and we keep doing it, you know, we're stuck in that mental set. The other thing that affects us are biases. And we all have them, I have them, everyone in this classroom has biases, right? I think what's important, and this is um, when I, because I also teach um, uh, in AODS, which is alcohol and other drug studies for those that don't know. And those are um, students who are going to be um, counselors in the future. And, um, you know, so I talk about biases all the time in, in those classes as well. Um, and that uh, to be a good counselor or a good therapist, we have to be aware of our biases, um, all kinds of biases, right? Um, but the biases I want you guys to be thinking of for the moment is, is those that, that knowledge and that reasoning that are used to make decisions, right? And we also need to realize that our ability um, to reason can be swayed or skewed by our biases, right? So if I, if I have a particular bias looking at a certain piece of information a certain way, and um, I may not be able to, to work around that. Uh, one of the things I always tell future counselors is, is you can't take a client any further than you've been. So if you're stuck in a particular place, you probably can't even see it, right? So um, being aware of that is very important. So these are the different types of biases. First, we have the anchoring bias. And that is the tendency to focus on one piece of information, a single piece of information, when making a decision or trying to solve a problem. You might have other pieces of information there, but you get stuck focused on one particular piece of information, um, which may not be helpful. And then there's confirmation bias. Um, and that is the tendency to focus on information that confirms your already existing beliefs. Um, so I, I'll give you uh, an example of that that I've run into. Uh, and I'm gonna give you an example. I just realized I gotta be careful how I phrase this because I don't wanna be disparaging or, and I'm not trying to be. I'll just, I'll just put it out there and then we'll talk about it if somebody is. So for me working in, in, in drug court, a lot of things that I've heard from, from people who don't understand what drug court actually is and does is, oh, that's just a, a, a hug a thug or you just let them get away with all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and then, then when I try to explain it to the individual about all the different things that we do, the therapies we do, um, just like what I've done in this class, talking about all the different types of, um, of uh, uh, theories that we use, right? Such as operant conditioning, social uh, learning theory, cognitive behavioral therapy, all of that kind of stuff. Um, they may reject that information, right? Because it doesn't fit their existing belief about what, how they view drug court as an example, right? 
so that they have that confirmation bias. They don't like drug court, so any information that might change their mind gets rejected, right? Same thing in politics. We hear, the, I mean, right now, and I don't want to get into politics, but I think everyone knows that we, we've got a pretty polarized um, political situation right now, and one side doesn't listen to the other, and vice versa. And, uh, and there's a lot of confirmation bias and echo chamber stuff happening there. Echo chamber is another way of reinforcing a person's confirmation bias. You're only listening to the material that you agree with that doesn't challenge your thinking. Then there's hindsight bias. Um, and that leads you to believe that the event you just experienced was predictable, even though it really wasn't. Right, so something happens, and you might say something to yourself like, "Oh, I should have seen that coming." That might be a verbalization of hindsight bias. And then there's representative bias, which is the tendency to unintentionally stereotype someone or something. Um, this I would separate from prejudice, because I think what's important here is is that it's unintentional, whereas, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on um, in the uh, social psychology chapter, where we talk about um, bigotry, discrimination, racism, that kind of stuff, um, which is, is more um, intentional. Uh, but representative bias can lead a person in that direction. I'm not gonna say it doesn't, but we're looking at it at, at this point is we're unintentionally stereotyping someone or something. And a person who's doing that may not even think of it as bad. They might even get called out on it and go, what are you talking about, right? Um, and then there's the availability heuristic, which is the tendency to make decisions based on an example or information or a recent experience that is readily available to you. So something similar happened, oh, this is what I did, um, before, maybe I can do this again. Um, and the danger here is, is that it may not be the best example in order to inform your decision, right? So it may not be the correct thing to do. So I know I threw a lot of words out there with biases. Uh, any questions on any of these? All right, very good. So now we're gonna talk about how we classify intelligence. Um, so what is intelligence? That is the question. <laughs> there are many different ways, according to psychologists, to um, define intelligence, right? And so we're gonna talk about uh, a couple of these now. So first, Charles Spearman, he's a um, psychologist. He believed that in, intelligence consisted of one general factor called G. That's what he called it. And it focused on commonalities that are amongst various intellectual abilities. And then um, Raymond Cattell uh, divided intelligence into two components. Um, he said that there was crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. And what crystallized intelligence is, is that's acquired knowledge um, and the ability to retrieve it. So for example, what we're talking about right now, you are probably using crystallized intelligence, right? You're, um, you're doing your homework. You did the discussion on um, Sheldon shaping Penny. Um, so you're acquiring that knowledge, that experience, um, you're learning these different terms, right? You're knowing facts, right? That's what's being, being taught, right? Uh, and you're picking all of that up and then you are, have the ability to then retrieve it, right? With fluid intelligence, that's the ability to see complex relationships and solve problems. So one is knowing facts and the other one is really knowing how to do something. So you'll probably notice that on, on my exams and even on the homework, there is kind of like knowledge-based questions, right? So where you have to 
select the correct definition for a term, that's really kind of like using your crystallized knowledge or intelligence. And then there's application questions, right? Those tend to be those longer ones where I give you an example of something um, and I'm testing more about your concept ability, right? Moving a little bit more toward the, the, the fluid intelligence, right? Being able to see the complex relationships and, and understanding what it is, what concept is being presented. And then there's the uh, triarchic uh, theory of intelligence. And this was Robert Sternberg's theory. And he identified three types of intelligence, um, one being practical, another one being creative, and then another one analytical. And so with analytical, right, that was academic problem solving, uh, computation type of um, intelligence. And then there's the creative intelligence, which is imaginative, innovative, problem solving. Um, you know, sometimes when we think of creative intelligence, we think of art, that's certainly true, art, music. Um, but, but creativity actually shows up in many different ways, right? Um, like I me mean, personally, I'm not artfully skilled or creative in that way, um, but I can create forms and set up processes like I have a real um, creative knack in that way. And I think everybody has some, some kind of creativity that they have going on. And then there's practical intelligence, which is um, known as like street smarts or common sense um, type stuff. Um, so those are the three, three uh, types of, of intelligence from Robert uh, Sternberg's theory. And then there's the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> and there's the multiple intelligences theory. And what Harder, uh, Howard Gardner proposed was that each person possesses at least eight intelligences, right? <coughs> excuse me. Uh, one is linguistic, in other words, language abilities. Um, logical or mathematical abilities, uh, intelligence, musical, um, uh, bodily kinesthetics, uh, spatial intelligence, interpersonal, intrapersonal, um, and by the way, items six and seven, interpersonal and intrapersonal, it's, those are two words that can be easily confused. So uh, make sure that you kind of, um, read your questions carefully on that too and, and understand which, which one is being asked. And then naturalist uh, intelligence. And when it comes to inter and intrapersonal intelligences, um, these are often combined to, if you've heard the term emotional intelligence, um, that's a person's ability to be able to perceive and, and, and act and react um, inter and intrapersonally. Uh, these are people who show empathy. Um, they understand social relationships and cues. Um, they're able to respond um, in culturally appropriate ways. Uh, and it looks like a question's come in. Okay, let's see. So I'm going to read this. And uh, okay, speaking on bias, examples of preconceived bias. Uh, based on media information. Yes, absolutely. Um, is when someone hears that an individual is a sex offender, the first thought that comes to mind. Yep, uh, child molester, hardly anyone thinks there are numerous sex offenses where an individual can be convicted and or charged with a sex offense. And that is very true. Um, if a person caught urinating in a public park could be charged with a sex offense, right? Um, when in actuality, sexual motivation was not even involved, right? But the problem is, is the exposure of sexual organs um, in a public place. And, um, but you're absolutely right. Um, and biases can be, since we're floating back to biases for a minute, are impacted by uh, news, our own personal experiences, 
um, social media, um, political beliefs, religious beliefs, all, all that stuff we, we filter through our own personal lenses. And that is absolutely correct. All right, so getting back to, um, uh, let's see, I finished up with, with this. Any questions on the multiple intelligences theory? Or any questions on like emotional intelligence? All right. So we kind of talked about this a minute ago, right? Creativity is the ability to generate, create, uh, discover new ideas, create solutions, explore new possibilities. Um, that's why I was saying earlier that um, not all creativity results in a song or a painting, for example, right? Um, but creative people usually have an intense knowledge about something. They've worked on it for years. Um, they look at novel solutions. Um, the other thing that's important too with creativity is that they seek out advice and they consult with other experts, right? Um, and a creative person is, is willing to take risks. So, um, so another way to think of creativity is, is thinking of it as a way to engage in uh, divergent thinking, right? As opposed to maybe more conventional thinking. Um, and divergent thinking is basically thinking outside the box. And that's used when um, more than one possibility can exist on a situation. Convergent thinking is the ability uh, to provide a correct or well-established answer um, to a problem. So divergent and convergent thinking. All right. So how do we measure intelligence? And what, is that, what does that even look like, right? Um, so a person's intelligence quotients, also known as the IQ score, is earned um, on a test designed to measure intelligence, right? And uh, so we're going to talk about a couple of these, right? So there's the Stanford Binet um, intelligence scale. And Alfred Binet, Binet was um, tasked um, by the French government to create an intelligence test to use um, on children, to determine which ones might have difficulty um, uh, in school. And then Lewis Terman, who was a Stanford psychologist, modified Binet's work by standardizing the administration of the test and testing thousands of children to establish a norm. So these are two more terms that is uh, going to be important for you to, to learn. Um, the first one is standardization. And so when you think of standardization of how a test is uh, given, in other words, how is it uh, administered? How is it scored? Um, how is it interpreted, right? Um, and making sure that those, that all of that is consistent. Uh, so standardization is really, is, is very important for consistency. And norming is when they are giving the test to a large population so that the data can be um, collected and compared, right? Um, so whenever you hear um, instruments being normed or have been normed for a particular group, in other words, that, that instrument has been tested, tested, retested, um, to make sure that the, uh, that the result is, um, that the resulting scores um, can be used for future, to interpret future scores. So in other words, this is how they determine on scales, for example. Um, and you need both standardization and norming in order to ensure that new scores are reliable which is really, really important. Some of the things with intelligence testing or IQ testing, some of the drawbacks that has been talked about over the years is that sometimes they may show lower scores for certain groups 
but then those groups may not have been exposed to certain um, concepts or ideas, right? So is it really is it really fair? So they've really been work doing a lot of work around um, IQ testing um, to make sure that 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 the results that they're getting is as accurate as can be. Yeah, and so here's a picture of Alfred Bernay. You definitely will be uh, have the possibility of seeing him on the uh, exam as well. And then there's the uh, Wexler's Adult Intelligence Scale or the WAIS um, scale. And his definition of um, intelligence was the global capacity of a person to act purposely, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with his environment. And so he developed an IQ test by combining several subtests from other intelligence tests. So he tapped into like a variety of verbal and nonverbal skills. Um, and this is actually one of the most extensively used intelligence tests. Um, so there's several different versions, right? And so the WISC um, 5, which is the um, Wexler in Intelligence Scale for Children, um, Roman numeral V is, I mean, it, the V is a Roman numeral 5, is one of the many versions used today that tests uh, a child's verbal comprehension, their visual and spatial reasoning, fluid reasoning, their working memory and processing speed. Um, and then another uh, thing that I want you to um, know is the Flynn effect. And I think there's only one small paragraph in the book. So if you skimmed the book, you might've missed this, but, um, but it does talk about the Flynn effect. And what that is, is that after years of use within schools and communities, um, and then they, you know, they periodically recalibrate that, it's led to an observation that each generation um, it has a significantly higher IQ than the previous one. So with successive generations, the IQs uh, scores are getting, are, are, are raising. So here is an example of a bell curve. And um, the bell curve um, for intelligent, well, the intelligence one, actually, that's what the IQ bell curve looks like. We're going to talk about it here in just a second. Um, but, but in psychological testing, the graph demonstrates a, a representative sample or a representative normal distribution of a trait in human population, right? So for example, if we're looking here, let me turn on my um, laser pointer. So if we're looking at the height of US women, um, and along this axis is the frequency of when of the of the particular height, and along this axis is the height itself, right? So you have four foot ten inches at the low end of the scale, um, and five foot ten inches at the higher end of the scale. That's what's marked. It actually goes a little beyond that. You'll notice that the distribution, the average um, uh, height for Women is what, according to this bell curve? What would be the average height for women? 5.5. 5.5, that's right. Five feet, five inches. And you know that because um, if the, the top of the bell curve, that's where your average is, right? And if you follow that down, there's your answer. It's between five foot four and five foot six. So we're going to go with five foot five, right? Um, so if we look at the bell curve for IQ, right? The average IQ is 100. And the standard deviation, which is, um, which is a statistical description of how um, data is dispersed within a population, right? Is 15 points. So um, the way, for instance, if I wanted to say that um, uh, Johnny 
has an IQ of 115, I could also say it by saying that he is one standard deviation above the mean, which is 100, right? So this is one standard deviation. This is two standard deviations. This would be three standard deviations. So that's, that's another way that you can describe that. So um, I think on the test, you will need to kind of remember that standard deviation is 15 points. That will make it easier for you possibly to answer the question and also to understand what standard deviation is. And it's just, again, uh, it's a description of how the data is dispersed um, across, the, across the bell curve. So 82% of the population have an IQ score that between 85 and 115. So the vast majority of the population rests in this area. And then when it comes to intellectual disabilities or, you know, individuals that experience um, that experience these disabilities, uh, about 2%, 2.2% of the population have an IQ score below 70. And these individuals are considered um, to be experiencing an intellectual uh, disability, right? Um, they experience um, deficits in intellectual functioning, adaptive behavior, um, the, the former word for it, which we, we don't use anymore, um, is mental retardation. Um, that, that term has gone out of style. And if you recall, like at the beginning of the semester, when I talked about words that matter, we don't use words like crazy. We don't call people retards, things like that. That's just being, um, that's just being respectful. And you'll notice that even as I was describing it, I said people who are experiencing, you know, an intellectual disability, not an intellectually disabled person, right? So the person comes before the uh, um, before the disability, or like when I'm, uh, and I and I work very hard to do this because words do matter. Like when I'm talking about my clients, I don't call them addicts or alcoholics, right? They're clients who experience. Uh, substance use disorders or, or concerns, or their clients that are experiencing um, concerns with anxiety or depression, right? Um, you try to put the person beforehand. It's just a, a way to cut back on um, stigma and uh, that kind of stuff. But anyway, there are four types, subtypes of um, intellectual disability, and they go from mild um, to moderate to severe and profound. And you know, profound are the ones that, that will require the most amount of, of um, assistance in their life. And it looks like we have a question. Let me turn off my laser pointer, get that. So the question asks, uh, do they modify the testing for students with disabilities and how do they do it in schools? That is a really good question. And I actually don't have the uh, experience with that. Um, what I am aware of is that since they do take standardization and norming very important, that I would imagine um, based on, on the, like the WISC-5, right, where they've been updating it, that they are taking that stuff into consideration. And, um, you know, these tests are also designed to, to try to identify children who may need um, or require uh, extra assistance in school. Um, so like, uh, I've only, as a professor, I was teaching at Lincoln High School and I, um, attended one parent teacher 
uh, administration student conference for um, a student that had an individualized education plan. And those are usually developed for students that need that extra attention. So my experience in this part of it is really only limited to that, to that one experience. And what the testing was for that before they got to me, um, I do not know. Um, but that is a very good question. And another question, let's see. So the question is, is the term disorder as a description going out of style also? Well, the yes and no. I'm gonna go with the no first. No, because it is um, actual diagnoses in the DSM-5, which is the current way that um, people are, are being diagnosed, right? Um, so that's the no part of it. The yes part of it is, I'll give you an example. I worked at uh, VVSD and one of the things that we stopped doing are, and although it, again, words matter and, I, uh, and sometimes there's slip ups, but post-traumatic stress disorder is the actual diagnosis. But whenever I was talking to a client, we would refer to it as, as just post-traumatic stress we would drop the disorder from our language. So, um, so when speaking with clients, um, I drop the term disorder. When I'm speaking with clinicians or when I'm um, writing a diagnosis, um, the word disorder does need to be in there. So for instance, uh, even with substance use disorders, right? It's just, it's, because uh, uh, when we're rendering a diagnosis clinically, we have to render it the correct way as outlined in the DSM-5. But when speaking with clients, um, I usually use the word concerns or some other less stigmatizing word. But that's a very good question, John. And that's, that's how I address it. All right, so let's talk about the sources of intelligence. Um, so, as I told you in the beginning of the semester, nurture or nature, nature or nurture, um, here it is showing up again. And we will, we will see nature versus nurture throughout our time um, together, which by the way, you know, you, we have an exam coming up next week. Like we're almost halfway through the book. Time flies in the summer. Um, but the nature perspective is this, that intelligence is actually inherited from our parents, right? And that heritability has been researched using twin studies. Um, specifically, what I'm thinking of um, and that the book mentions is the Minnesota twin studies, which showed that, that identical twins raised apart, even if they're raised apart, show a higher correlation of IQ scores. In other words, their scores are similar than siblings or fraternal twins that were raised together. And since they're identical twins, they have identical genes, that definitely does uh, correlate to um, intelligence being heritable. Um, the nurture perspective is, is that intelligence is shaped by a child's developmental environment. Um, so if parents present children with intellectual stimuli, they read to them, um, they engage with them, or like what they were doing with the babies, you know, in that one video, uh, really engaged in, in, in talking with them. Um, having an, a, a stimuli, you know, a, a rich learning environment um, will be reflected in the child's intelligence levels, right? Um, most psychologists today believe that levels of intelligence uh, really is a combination of both right, um, that a person can be born with a natural ability, um, with that natural intelligence, um, but that they're also going to be using their environment as well. Um, and then there's range of reaction, and you'll recall that from the last section where we talked about range of reaction with genetics inter um, interacting with our environment. Um, and this is the theory that a person responds to the environment in a unique way 
based on his or her own genetic makeup. Now, genetics is a fixed quantity, right? We can't change our genetics. Um, but whether a person is able to reach their full intellectual potential is dependent upon environmental factors. So let's go back to the twin studies again. Let's say you have um, you know, the two twins, they're identical twins. One is raised in a very rich environment. Their mind is stimulated. Uh, their intellect is supported by the environment. And the other one is raised in a, um, in a, in an environment that was, um, that denied him that kind of um, stimulation or wasn't as supportive. Uh, you may see based on range of reaction differences in their intelligence, right? Um, because one was able to reach his full intellectual potential and the other one may not have been, may have been prevented from that. So, um, in this case, it, it appears that most psychologists are saying, based on range of reaction uh, and nature versus uh, nature and not versus, but nature and nurture perspectives, um, uh, all go into um, the source of a person's intelligence. Oops. And then this is. Um, a chart from the uh, uh, from the book that talks about um, uh, the the results from the um, children raised apart, uh, identical twins raised apart, right? So if you look at this chart, um, here's the relationship along this axis, and this is the percent of IQ correlation, right? So how closely um, their IQs were correlated. So You'll see that I uh, turn on my laser pointer. You'll see that identical twins raised apart at the bottom of the graph how it show the highest correlation of um, IQs. Right, fraternal twins raised together, um, still pretty high when when compared to some of these others, but lower than identical twins. And then uh, parent-child pairs. So in other words, that's a uh, you know, like a mother-daughter, for instance, um, half siblings, where only 25% of the genes are shared, um, and then adoptive siblings um, and other unrelated, right? So in other words, this section is no genes are shared. So this definitely shows that there is um, definitely um, heritability involved here. So. All right. And then the last section we're gonna talk about, um, oh, it looks like we might, I didn't think we were gonna end a little early, but it looks like we might. Um, are children that experience learning disabilities. Um, and so these are cognitive disorders that affect different areas of cognition. Um, specifically, uh, or in particular, I should say, language and reading, right? Uh, most people are very familiar with um, dyslexia, which is actually the, I'm going to turn on my laser pointer, the second item on this list, right? Dyslexia. Um, dysgraphia, some of you may have heard of that before, may, maybe not until you read the book. Um, but that is the learning disability that results in, in an individual being uh, unable to write legibly. They have difficulty putting their thoughts down on paper. They, 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 just, they just have trouble writing. Um, then of course, dyslexia is the inability to correctly process letters. Um, so you'll see here on the side, the word teapot um, that's written by an individual that is experiencing um, uh, symptoms of, of dyslexia. And you can see the, the changes in the lettering and the transposition and, and then how it's written. Um, this is the most common um, 
learning disability that, that children experience. Um, and then one, another one that you may not have um, heard of until this, until a, a reading is um, dyscalculia, which is the uh, difficulty in learning or comprehending, comprehending arithmetic. They will confuse symbols like the plus sign and the minus sign or the equal sign. Um, uh, they, they, have, they just have trouble with, with um, those types of symbols and with, with mathematics. Um, so these are the main ones that I'm focusing on that, um, uh, that I will want you guys to know for the exam. Um, you may see these in any number of ways. So, uh, and I put the pronunciation here to, to, help, with, uh, to help with that too, because sometimes <laughs> pronunciation can be difficult. So, and I believe this is the last slide and I am correct. So that is going to conclude tonight's lecture. Um, I uh, don't go anywhere yet. I'm not dismissing class just yet. Um, but let me stop this recording.